Uh, we can we can get started now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nick Van Acker. I am one of the educators here at the MSU Museum. I am joined today by my colleague, Nadja. Nadja, if you want to say hello. Hey, everyone. Yeah, and so um, Nadja is one of our student science on sphere presenters. Um, I am our science on sphere coordinator, and we're very excited to be telling you today all about the science of springtime, talking about springtime on the sphere. Um, so throughout the program today, we're going to talk a little bit about the science of why spring occurs. We'll talk about some of the changes that are occurring on the earth as we roll into spring. And then we'll also take a mini tour of our Hall of Animal Diversity to go check out some of the animals that you might be seeing appear in your backyard this spring. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly science on a sphere is. So science on a sphere is the big ball that is hanging up behind me in this gallery, our science on a sphere gallery. Science on a Sphere is a project that was developed by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And NOAA developed the sphere to showcase all of the really cool data sets. And so these data sets are basically just big ways to visualize data and show global stories. So for instance, as you can see behind me, we can look at the Earth. We can also look at other planets, other stars. We'll actually be looking at a star today. Um, we can look at animal migrations, human stories, and all sorts of great things on the sphere. Um, we're going to be looking at all sorts of different stuff today, so it should be pretty fun. Um, the sphere itself is pretty simple technology. It's just a big gray ball that hangs from the ceiling, and there are four projectors, one in each corner of this room, and those projectors work together to project those data sets onto the sphere. So it looks really cool, but it's not magic, I promise. It's just science. But with that, we can get started. Um, I already mentioned at the beginning, but for those of you just joining us, if you do have any questions or comments throughout the program, you can feel free to leave those in the chat. Uh, not just going to be moderating the chat, and so we'll be happy to get those answered and addressed for you. But with that, we can get started. So I've already mentioned that behind me on Science on a Sphere, we are looking at a planet. Um, this is a planet that we should all be familiar with, and it's actually very important this month because April is Earth Month. Um, so the planet behind me is, of course, the Earth. Um, it's my favorite planet, the third rock from the sun, but I'm a little bit biased because we all live here. Um, but this is a really, really cool visualization of the Earth. So this is a visualization of the Earth that's made by NASA, and it's an incredibly detailed, true color depiction of the Earth. I just got a comment that said, uh, I need to turn on my camera. I think that it's just showing the other camera. Are you all able to see me? We can wait for a second in the chat just to just to make sure you're all able to see me. Yes, okay, you can see me now. Sorry about that. We always forget with the virtual with the virtual stuff. We want to make sure that people can see you and hear you. Those are the most important things. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. But so this is the blue marble hanging up behind me on Science on a Sphere, and it is a true color depiction of the Earth made by NASA. Uh, this is a really cool data set. You might think that it's pretty easy to take a picture of the Earth, uh, but it's actually really difficult. This took a really long time to create. So this blue marble is actually a composite of images taken in 2001 over the course of many months. So this picture was actually taken between June to September of 2001. So that's June, July, August, September. That's four months that it took to create this. And you might think, you know, what's the big deal? We can take a picture of the Earth from space. We might be able to take it with satellites. The problem with taking a picture of the Earth is all the white stuff you see all over it, all of those clouds. The problem with clouds is that when you're taking a picture from space, they block the land and the water. So it took four months for all the clouds to move around the Earth so scientists were able to capture every single square inch of the Earth's surface. And then the cloud data set is actually another picture that was taken on top of that. And that went a little bit faster. That one only took about three days to photograph. Um, so these pictures were compiled together to make this beautiful spinning blue marble of the Earth that is behind me. And that's really, really great. It's awesome that we're able to look at the Earth in this way. But this doesn't really show us what the Earth looks like, right? If we're looking at this, this is just a snapshot of what the Earth looked like over a small period of time. The Earth, in reality, is constantly changing over time. And so we can actually pull up another data set to show that a little bit better. So I'm going to pull up another version of this Blue Marble data set, and this one is called Blue Marble Seasonal. I'm going to rotate it around just a little bit so we're looking at North and South America, just so we can see territory we're probably a little bit more familiar with. 
And so you'll see that in this version of the blue marble, looking at blue marble seasonal, there are all sorts of changes starting to occur on the sphere. Um, the main difference that we're able to see, at least looking at this video, is all this white stuff coming down all the way down across North America. Um, and if you're from North America, you're probably familiar with what this white stuff is. It's not clouds, it is, of course, snow. So if we're looking at this picture of the Earth over the course of a year, rotating through all the seasons, which is what we're looking at here. This is uh, looking at all of the seasons occurring, I believe, in 2004. Um, but we can see in this real-time you know, illustration, looking at how the seasons changed in 2004, that the Earth is constantly moving and shifting around. So as the year progresses, all the snow comes down in the winter, disappears in the spring, recedes all the way up in the summer, and then as fall starts to come, again, it comes down. And this is true all over the Earth. And this is something that we're pretty familiar with, right? This idea of seasons, that things change over time. We're going into the season of spring right now. We actually just started spring. Uh, the first day of spring was, I believe, March 20th, so just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but even looking at this, this doesn't really answer a big question. And that question is, why exactly do seasons occur at all? And so to do that, we actually have to step a little bit further back from the Earth. Right now, if we're looking at the Earth from above the atmosphere, we're going to have to step a little bit further back into outer space to get a really good idea of why seasons actually occur. And so to do that, I'm going to change our sphere. Right now, we're looking at the Earth. And instead, we're going to look at another body in our solar system. And that body is the sun. So I'll rotate the sun around just a little bit so we're all able to see it. Um, this is actually a data set that's called uh, Sun in Real Time. So we're looking at the sun more or less in real time about what's happening on the surface of the sun. Um, this data set starts back in, I believe, January of 2021, and then it moved forward up to April. So we're looking at what was happening in February right now. But we'll get up to today's date pretty soon here. And then in my hand, I have a model of the Earth so we can get a better idea of what exactly this relationship looks like between the Earth and the Sun. Um, we're probably pretty familiar with some of the ways that the Earth is related to the Sun. So for instance, we all know that the Earth revolves around the Sun. So I won't run all the way around the room, but if I were representing the Earth here with my ball, the Earth would be constantly moving around in a circle all the way around the sun. Um, when the sun is hitting the earth, we know that the earth is being hit with sunlight and with heat. So any side of the earth that is facing the sun is going to be constantly hit with all of that light. And then the side that's facing you guys, that's facing away from the sun would be in darkness. Um, this is what causes day and night. When the sun is hitting the earth, it's day. When the sun is hitting our, the other side of the earth, it is night. Um, but of course, that's not the whole story, right? We know that the Earth also, in addition to just revolving, rotating, orbiting around the sun, it also rotates by itself on an axis. So as the Earth is moving all the way around the sun, it's also spinning like this. And this is what really causes day and night, right? Because one side of the Earth isn't constantly being hit with light. We know that the light hitting the Earth changes throughout the day because the Earth is rotating as well. So now we've got this big picture of the sun hitting the side of the Earth the Earth is rotating, so sometimes the area you're in is going to be hit with light, sometimes it's going to be in darkness. But there's also one other part to this story, and that is that the Earth does not rotate perfectly on a straight up and down axis. The Earth is actually tilted at 23.5 degrees. So if we imagine the axis as an imaginary line that goes through the Earth, it's tilted just like this. Um, and this means that as the Earth rotates and revolves, Sometimes certain parts of the Earth are a lot closer to the sun and other parts of the Earth are further away. So we've got this rotation that the Earth is going through causing day and night, but the Earth is also constantly on this tilt as it revolves around the sun. And that means that the, uh, certain parts of the Earth, whether it's either the top of the Earth or the bottom, are going to be closer or further away. And this is what actually causes the seasons. So it makes sense if you think about it, right? That if the earth, certain parts of the earth are closer to the sun, they're going to be a little bit warmer. If parts of the earth are a little bit away from the sun, they're gonna be a little bit cooler. Um, so as the Northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun for part of the revolution around the sun, the Northern hemisphere is gonna be experiencing summer because that temperature is a little bit warmer. As the Southern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun and the Northern hemisphere is tilted away, the Southern hemisphere will be warmer experiencing summer. 
the Northern Hemisphere will be experiencing winter. Of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, there's, we have an atmosphere and we have all sorts of systems that distribute heat across the surface of the earth. Um, but this is the basics of why we have different seasons. And this also leads to all sorts of weird phenomenon occurring in the earth. And we're gonna look at a data set that shows that a little bit better. Um, but for instance, you might have heard that at the North Pole, there's certain times of year when uh, the sun is up 24 hours a day and same thing at the South Pole. And that's totally true. And the reason for that is because the earth is tilted. So if the earth is tilted toward the sun, for instance, the South Pole is gonna be facing away from the sun. So even as the earth rotates, it's going to be, the South Pole will be in constant darkness. And then as the earth kind of wobbles, as it revolves around the sun, eventually the North Pole will be in total darkness, even as the days go by. So it makes a lot of sense. It's a really, really cool system that we've got that ends up causing these seasons to occur. Um, we've got a data set on here that is really, really cool um, that kind of shows how this occurs. Uh, and it's called the Terminator data set. Now we're not gonna be looking at pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Sarah Connor, um, but the Terminator is a, a term that we use talking about planetary bodies and specifically the earth. Um, I'll rotate the Earth around a little bit so we can see the Terminator a little bit. Um, the Terminator is this line right here. So you can see that on this side, the Earth is covered in light. On the other side, the Earth is covered in darkness. And the Terminator is the fuzzy line that runs right between them. And so you can see that the Terminator is slowly kind of waving back and forth. Um, what actually happens is that the Terminator stays in place and the Earth is constantly moving. So I wish that we had a, a better visualization of this that just kept the Terminator in one place and then the Earth was rotating around. Um, but the Terminator, this line between day and night, um, represents the change in the seasons for us. So you can see there's a little ticker down at the bottom of the screen. We're looking at April right now. We're going into May and June. And so these months relate to the tilt of the Earth and then therefore the tilt of the Terminator. So we'll see that in February, for instance, if I pause it right now, I guess we're actually, we're looking at, uh, oops, will you pause? There we go. Okay, so we're looking at July right now here on the sphere. And so we can see that the Terminator is at a pretty steep angle. And so if I rotate the sphere around, you'll notice that Australia is in sunlight. Most of the South Pole right now is in shadow. And then as we go around here, we'll see that again, it's at a pretty, pretty steep tilt here. Um, and then that North America is in the dark. So this is what it would look like, say at probably midnight um, on July 25th at uh, at least midnight in the United States in, in our time period, um, in our time zone. So we can see that the earth is completely dark on our side of the, the earth in the Eastern hemisphere or in the, in the Western hemisphere, excuse me. And then the Eastern hemisphere is covered in light. Um, so if I rotate the earth a little bit, then we'll be able to see this idea a little bit better. So I'll flatten out the Terminator so it's straight. And we can see then now that the earth is tilted at this 23.5 degree angle, that it's really, really huge tilt, right? Uh, compared to the map that we're used to seeing. And so that means that for instance, the North Pole, like we were talking about, is going to be almost completely in the sun. Um, and even as we move forward in time, we'll see that it's completely covered. And then as we go forward into fall and winter, the North Pole is going to be completely covered in shadow. And then as we move back again. Um, so the Terminator is a really cool thing. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around a little bit. Um, but once you get the idea that this is just the shadow um, on the, the dark side of the Earth um, at, at midnight, it's a, it's a really cool thing to look at and visualize about how the Earth is tilting and changing. Um, we also have another data set here that's a little bit crazier. It's going to move a little bit faster. Um, so that was looking at the Terminator every single day. Um, this is looking at what we call the Terminator hourly. Um, so this is going to be changing just um, every single day how the Terminator actually rotates around the Earth. So it's going to look pretty similar um, for quite a while, but then we'll see that the change starts to, starts to occur as the, the Earth is rotating around. Um, this one's pretty fun, but it also is, is a little bit crazy looking. Um, so we'll probably move on from there. Um, but as we're looking at this Terminator, as we're thinking about how the Earth is tilting and changing as it rotates and revolves around the sun, um, there is, of course, a big change that comes with this, these rotations and revolutions. And that change is going to be temperature. So as the sun is, or as the earth, parts of the earth are closer to the sun, those areas are going to be warmer. And we can actually see that reflected in some of our data sets. So this is a data set that I like a lot. This looks at land temperature on the earth. 
Looks like I'm a little bit out of focus here. We can wait for it to focus. There we go. Um, and so this is looking at land temperature throughout the year. Um, and this data set is actually doing a real time data set as well. So this is looking at the land surface temperature of the earth for the last year. And again, I'll zero in on Michigan so we can have a little bit of a better idea about what's happening in our own backyards. Um, the colors represent what you would expect them to. So the blue colors represent cooler temperatures. The red colors represent warmer temperatures. Um, I believe the coldest blue temperature, the darkest blue, is negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, of course, it never really gets that cold here in Michigan, so we won't ever see us become super dark blue. Um, the warmest temperatures represent about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, we don't ever get that hot in Michigan usually, so we won't see those colors necessarily. But as the year starts to change, um, we're going into January, February of 2021, we'll notice that Michigan does start to get a little bit bluer as those temperatures start to get colder. Now, we're in the end of February, we're going to start getting into March in just a second, and we'll notice, of course, that blue is starting to go away, and that Michigan is starting to get a little bit warmer. And again, we can remember that's because the Earth is tilted a little bit closer toward the sun at this point. Um, we are not, of course, fully tilted toward the sun. Um, we are going to be fully tilted toward the sun at the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year. That's going to give us the most amount of sunlight, the longest day, and also uh, some of the warmer temperatures in the middle of this summer. Um, but yeah, this is a really cool data set looking at the temperature and how that relates to the tilt of the Earth. And of course, with these changing temperatures come a lot of the changes that we expect to see in the spring. Again, like I said, they're not necessarily the entire reason for it, but they're some of the main reasons for the changes that we start to see in the spring. We start to see the land and the air warm up, and with that comes something that we're all familiar with in the spring, and that is April showers. I know we just had rain a couple of days ago, at least where I live down in Jackson. Um, and so we can see here on this map, this is another real-time data set looking at real-time precipitation on the Earth. And again, this is looking over the course of a year. So right now we are looking at, um, we're looking at March 2021 right now. Um, and I'll move down again so we can see Michigan a little bit. Um, this has two different color maps going on. So the top color map, it looks like it's going from green to red. That represents liquid precipitation. That represents rain. And then the blue to the purple represents frozen precipitation. So things like snow and hail. All right. So it looks like, Frank, you have a question. It says, why in Michigan is July and August warmer than June, even though there is less sunlight? That is a great question, Frankie. So that gets into part of the reason of, um, like I said, that this isn't the total cause of it, right? So it'd be great if it was a really simple solution of saying, you know, when the earth is tilted closest to the sun, those are the warmest days. When it's tilted a little bit further, those are the coldest days. And that's true overall, but then there's also a lot of other factors going on. So for instance, the earth has an atmosphere that helps to trap in heat. There's air currents. Um, there's you know things with topography of all the different shapes of the land of mountains and valleys um, where lakes are located. So all this stuff actually ends up contributing to when we have cold weather, when we have warm weather, um, and how temperatures uh, that we experience um, individually occur. Um, so we could say that overall, probably that these areas are going to be, um, you know, they're going to be warmer for when the uh, areas are closest to the sun. Um, and that's true if we look at it as like a trend. We say, you know, the summer when North America is pointed to the sun is the warmest, but not necessarily at the times that we always expect it to be. Yeah, so Frankie says like a heat sink. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to think about it. So the, the atmosphere is another system on top of this system that ends up trapping some of that heat, moving some of that heat around um, and just changing the way that we would expect it. Um, that's another reason that scientists can't be 100% certain when scientists are predicting the weather or they're predicting temperature or even predicting climate change into the future. Um, we can have models, we can make our best guesses, but these systems are really crazy and dynamic. Like we can see behind me looking at this weather map. Um, yeah, so things things change. We can't always perfectly predict things. Sometimes they're a little bit wonky, a little bit wonkier than we'd expect. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, but so yeah, so looking at those temperatures, those temperatures are going to change uh, some of the weather and some of the precipitation that we can expect for those exact same reasons. Uh, when the atmosphere starts to heat up, it's going to start moving some of the molecules around, start to have a little bit of a party, um, and that of course starts to cause things like precipitation and storms. 
Um, we're actually going to talk about precipitation in a little bit later. We'll talk about a little bit more detail about how spring storms form. Um, but for now, we'll just talk, we'll just remember the idea that this warmer temperature starts to bring a little bit more uncertainty, starts to bring a little bit more storms to the area. Um, and of course, those storms are rainstorms as the, the weather warms up, starts to bring some nice wet rain down to the surface. And with rain and with warm weather, of course, come another change for spring, which are plants. So I've got another data set that we can pull up here. This is looking at seasonal vegetation on the earth. Um, this is a really cool data set. I like this one a lot. Um, this is looking at the changes in seasonal vegetation between April 2012 and April 2013. So just a couple of years ago. Um, and it's going to start in April 2012. It looks like right now we are in September of 2012, and then it's going to continue on into the winter. And as we go into the winter, you'll start to see all of this, again, all this white stuff start to come down into North America as the seasons progress. Um, so when the winter comes, of course, as we know, plants don't survive very well. Some plants do, but a lot of plants don't like the cold. Um, so that green starts to disappear in our area of North America. And then as the temperature warms up and as those rains come, plants start to grow. Um, there's actually a really great program, kind of coincidentally, that Waldemar Nature Center did with the Science Festival just a couple of days ago, um, talking all about some of the plants you can see in springtime. Um, sorry, Nadja, I didn't, uh, I didn't prepare you for that one. Um, but if you guys are able to look it up on the, the Science Festival Facebook page, I just saw it up there yesterday, um, if you're interested in some of the plants that are growing in our area um, uh, just around this time of year as the spring starts to appear. Um, so that's a really interesting talk, but of course, what we're interested in talking about here at the museum are the animals that will start to appear as this vegetation starts to grow. Um, we'll go upstairs in just a moment to look at some of the animals that we could see coming this spring. Um, but there's one data set that we have that's one of my favorites that shows some of these animals uh, moving around as the temperature and vegetation and rain changes. Um, and this is the bird migration data set. So this is a really, really cool data set. Um, this shows over 180 different species of birds that are flying um, all around North and South America throughout the course of the year. Again, we're looking at mainly temperature here. So as we can see, the blue represents colder temperatures. The red represents warmer temperatures. As the winter comes, our area starts to get a little bit colder. So all of these birds will migrate south to try and stay away from those cold temperatures. And then as it starts to warm up in the spring, we'll start to see birds flying north. Um, these birds are birds that we're going to start seeing probably in our gardens pretty soon, if you haven't already. They're also some of the birds that we'll see upstairs, um, but these are migratory birds. So these are going to be songbirds and uh, birds like robins and blue jays and things that, you know, you're used to seeing in your Michigan backyard. Um, and like I said, we're going to check out some of those in just a moment. Um, before we do that, though, I'm going to have to move upstairs. So in the meantime, I had promised we were going to talk a little bit about the way that storms form in the spring. Um, so Nadja, are you, are you ready to, uh, to show us that on, on uh, your screen? Yep, I'll just take a moment to share my screen real quick. Excellent. So we can start sharing that. This is going to be a little bit of a video from Science on a Sphere showing us how storms form in the springtime. Let me know if you can hear the video. We are not able to hear it, Nadja. Okay, one sec. Um, How about now? Yes, that is perfect. Okay. Springtime on the Great Plains. Mother Nature has been working hard all day, making an atmospheric soup. On this particular day, separate ingredients are brought together from all across the globe to create severe storms. If certain atmospheric ingredients are lacking, the soup comes out bland and sunny skies are the result. The soup can also be spoiled if the portions are too large. Today, however, everything has come together nicely for Mother Nature. Her 
Ergo, a supercell thunderstorm. A supercell is unique in that it is very well organized. The storm is fed by a steady inflow of air near the surface, shown in green. The strong winds higher in the atmosphere, in orange, carry away rain and hail so they do not interrupt the air below. The red, rotating column of air, called the mesocyclone, provides the motion necessary to form tornadoes. The bottom of this storm may become so large that it easily covers an entire county. The storm's top, called the anvil, spreads out even wider and crosses into other states. This is a variety of storm Mother Nature will stir up today. Let's take a step back and look at her recipe's special ingredients. When liquid water evaporates into water vapor, it spreads into the air as moisture, just like steam rising from this pot. Meteorologists measure the air's humidity using the dew point. On this globe, a lighter color means the dew point is higher, so there is more moisture in the air. This map shows sea surface temperatures in late May. Here, lighter colors indicate warmer water. Surface winds cross the warm ocean water and carry moisture ashore. The Gulf of Mexico is gradually getting warmer at this time of the year. These winds bring humid air across the southeastern U.S. and the Great Plains. Next, let's examine instability. The best way to understand this is to think about a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon rises because the air inside is less dense than the air around it. The hotter the balloon's air, the faster it rises. This property is called instability. As the sun heats the earth, it provides the energy for bubbles of warm, moist air to rise high into the atmosphere. When there is high instability, the air rises quickly and forcefully. This provides storms with strong updrafts and a constant supply of moisture. This map shows instability across the world in late May. On this day, there is adequate instability in the Great Plains for severe storms to occur. So far, we've talked about moisture and instability. These are important for maintaining a strong storm after it forms. To get things started, however, the air needs a bump in the right direction. This is where the ingredient lift comes in. Lift is often the result of two separate air masses coming together. You may know these boundaries as fronts. Along cold fronts, cooler air forces existing warm air upward. A warm front appears where warmer air glides over cooler air. Another type of front is called a dry line. Here, air masses differ by their humidity. When a dry line forms in the Great Plains in spring and summer, it is often the initiation site for storms. Mountains and wide sloping plains are also a source of lift. When winds encounter this so-called upslope flow, this can be the right amount of oomph to get things going. This is often the case in the western Great Plains, where the terrain gradually slopes up to the base of the Rocky Mountains. Moisture, instability, and lift are three necessary ingredients for everyday thunderstorms. However, we need one more thing. To create powerful supercell storms that produce tornadoes, the final ingredient is shear. Recall our diagram of the supercell. 
Note how the green winds near the surface come into the storm at a right angle to the purple and orange winds. This difference in direction creates rolling, turbulent air between these two layers, known as shear. Imagine we are high in the air, looking straight down at the ground. These arrows represent the direction of winds close to the surface. And these arrows show the flow of winds higher up. The different speed and direction of these two layers creates an area of shear. Mmm, can you smell it? With a handful of moisture, an abundance of instability, a pinch of lift, and a hearty dose of shear. It looks like Mother Nature has really cooked up a nice storm today. All right, so that is a great look at some of the storms that we might be experiencing this spring. Hopefully just the rainstorms and thunderstorms, not any tornadoes, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, but it's a really fantastic way to look at the idea that these storms are a little bit more complicated, right? They don't just, uh, they don't just come from the, the excess temp temperature and a little bit more humidity. Uh, there's lots of little bits to it that cause these storms to occur. Um, but with that, you'll notice, of course, that like magic, I have changed location. Uh, I moved up one floor in the museum. I am now in our Hall of Animal Diversity. And behind me, you will see that we have a display case. And this is our display of Michigan backyard animals. Um, so I'm going to highlight a couple of these guys, some of them that you've probably seen in your backyards already, or that you might be seeing in your backyards pretty soon. So I'm on a cart. I'm going to roll us around a little bit. I apologize for any noise that might occur. But we'll get right up close to our first animal. Oh, and I see we have a question here from Frankie as well that says, with Michigan surrounded by water, why are we often in a drought? That is another gr great question, Frankie. And again, it just has to do with some of the, the instability that they mentioned in the video, but also just all sorts of other, other factors that go into it. I'm not a meteorologist or a climatologist, so I can't speak for certain about why, why we're in a drought, um, but it's the, the same sort of reason that uh, uh, you know, we have like lake effect snow and things that even though we are surrounded by these bodies of water, they interact in ways that are a little bit weird, right? Um, so for instance, if we don't have a bunch of mountains in Michigan, but if we did have a bunch of mountains, uh, we have know the idea of uh, storms coming in, hitting those mountains and dumping all the water right uh, on one side of the mountain and the other side of the mountain being dry, even though the mountains are, you know, the, the sides of the mountain are very close to each other. Um, it's not, of course, in that case in Michigan because we don't have a bunch of mountains. Um, but topography and all sorts of different things can contribute to, to these, um, to the amount of water that we get um, and areas of drought or high rain. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't know the exact answer to that question, um, but it's a very good one and one that I'm interested in learning more about. Um, yeah, but with that, of course, we can, we can start talking about some of these Michigan animals that we're able to see in our own backyards today. Um, we've got two friends right behind me here. Um, we've got one and two. Of course, we're all familiar with what type of animal these are. These are, of course, squirrels. Um, if you're from Michigan or if you've lived in Michigan for any length of time, you've definitely seen squirrels in your backyard. I know that I just had to chase one away from my bird feeder this morning. Um, and the one that I actually chased away was a fox squirrel, which is this type right up here. Uh, fox squirrels are really uh, very, very well distributed in Michigan. Um, they're kind of your typical brown squirrel that you might see. Um, and they are really crafty. They're really, really cool animals. Um, a lot of people will see squirrels and just kind of write them off. Um, one thing that's very interesting about squirrels that I didn't know until recently um, is what happens to squirrels in the winter. Um, so I always knew, of course, that squirrels must survive somehow in the winter, but I'd never really given it much thought about where squirrels go. Um, but it turns out the squirrels actually build nests and they live in these nests for most of the year. Um, 
depending on the time of year, they'll live in a different type of nest. So uh, in the winter, they'll usually try and nest in the hollow cavity of a tree, um, which makes sense because trees are really good insulation against the cold. Um, but in the summer, squirrels will build nests that are called drays, and that's D-R-E-Y. And you can actually see these drays anytime you're walking around, especially this time of year when the leaves aren't on the trees. They look like big balls of dead leaves and sticks that are growing way up in the top of a tree. Um, but it's not actually, I mean, it is a ball of dead leaves and sticks, but it's not a natural phenomenon growing from the tree. That's actually something that's made by a squirrel. It's a squirrel nest. Um, so sometimes squirrels will live in these drays for multiple years. Um, sometimes squirrels will even have multiple nests because they want to keep them nice and clean. So if one nest gets lice, then they'll move to another nest. Um, it's really, really interesting. So I definitely recommend learning more about Michigan squirrels if you have the time looking up squirrel nests. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool thing. Um, so that's one type of squirrel that lives in Michigan. We actually have quite a few squirrels that live in Michigan, quite a few different types. There's these tree squirrels. We also have flying squirrels. Um, but one of the most common types of squirrels you're probably also going to see are gray squirrels, which is this squirrel right here below me. Um, now, of course, if you're looking at the squirrel, you'll say, that squirrel's not gray, that's a black squirrel. What are you talking about? Um, so if you've ever seen a gray colored squirrel or you've seen a black colored squirrel, those are actually the same type of animal. They're the exact same species. Um, the difference is just that black squirrels have a color morph. So gray is what we would call sort of like the natural classic way that the squirrel looks. And then the black squirrel is a color morph of the gray squirrel, but they're the same species. Um, but the cool thing about black squirrels is that because it's a genetic quirk that occurs in the squirrels, only certain areas have populations of black squirrels. So East Lansing, for instance, if you've been on Michigan State's campus, you've been in the East Lansing area, East Lansing has a lot of these black squirrels. And that's actually for a kind of weird reason. So people, for whatever reason, really like to see black squirrels. I know that I do too. They're just really cool animals. Um, and that means that anytime somebody sees black squirrels, sometimes people will try and capture them and reintroduce them to new areas so that area can have black squirrels as well. And that's actually what happened here on campus. So it started way back in, I believe it was the 1800s, um, with actually the Kellogg brothers, which are the people who founded the Kellogg cereal um, that you know makes all the Frosted Flakes and everything that we're familiar with, all those types of cereals. Um, and if you didn't know, they're based in Battle Creek, Michigan. So one of the Kellogg brothers had a plot of land and he also really liked black squirrels. So he introduced black squirrels to that plot of land. Then those black squirrels bred and reproduced and lived on that land for a long, long time until eventually the family of the Kellogg brothers ended up donating that land to MSU. And that land became Kellogg Biological Station. And if you guys are familiar with campus at all, KBS is a really cool place where they do all sorts of great research and education all about wildlife. Once that land started to belong to MSU, one of MSU's past presidents, John Hanna, also really liked black squirrels. And he knew that there were black squirrels on that land. And so he asked the people at KBS if they could trap some black squirrels and bring them to main campus, which they did, and introduced those black squirrels to main campus. And now we have black squirrels all over main campus and all over East Lansing, but not in other areas of Lansing. And that's because the population was brought in and introduced here which is pretty interesting. So anytime you see a black squirrel, uh, it could have occurred naturally, but most likely uh, sometime in the past, probably there was one person who was influential and really liked black squirrels and brought the black squirrels to that area, which is pretty funny. Um, but we're lucky to have them here on campus. They're really pretty animals. They're really cool. So squirrels are of course some of the animals you might start to see be a little more, bit more active in the spring. Um, but the rest of this case is full of animals that you guys are probably a little bit more familiar with that you might see uh, quite a few more of in the spring. And that is of course, birds. There's a lot of different types of birds that you can see in your backyard here in Michigan. Uh, we can highlight just a couple of them here. Over on this side, we've got uh, what's called a red-winged blackbird. I've been seeing a lot of these in my backyard recently at the feeders. They're all starting to migrate north. They're really pretty animals if you get a chance to see one. Um, there's also a lot more of what we might call common animals. So there's a European starling here, which is actually an invasive species, but they're so widespread in Michigan, there's nothing we can do about them. They're here to stay. Um, morning doves is another one that you guys will probably see in Michigan pretty regularly that make the coo coo sound if you hear that. Uh, blue jays as well. But one of my personal favorite animals is down here on the bottom. I'll tilt my camera a little bit so you all can see it. And that is the North American robin. 
Robins are really, really pretty birds. I've got that nice red chest. Um, and robins are actually doing something really cool right now. And that is that males are starting to defend territories and females are starting to build nests. So if you pay attention to birds at all, you might've seen these robins really, really active recently um, where the males might kind of be fighting each other or they might be uh, making a lot of loud noises, trying to scare off rival males. Um, you might've seen females starting to collect materials for their nests. Um, I know that I've got some in my backyard. Anytime I go out early in the morning, the males are fighting constantly. And they'll actually do something called swooping where they'll view me as a threat and try and you know try and attack me to, to show me who's boss, which I think is really funny. Um, but yeah, so robins are doing some really, really cool stuff right now. Um, and they start nesting in April. They'll usually do two, uh, two nesting periods. They'll have two different broods, two different groups of babies. Um, one is starting right about this time. And then the second one will be in about July. Um, so if you see a robin nest, there might be some things in there pretty soon. Let's see. And then Frankie says, if you have trees trimmed or removed, what time of year is best so the squirrels are not harmed? That is a great question. So it's pretty hard to, uh, to actually harm a squirrel in, uh, in uh, the, the area that we live in, um, just because we've created really, really good habitat for squirrels. So even if you do need to have a tree trimmed or removed, you're probably not going to be displacing that squirrel too far. It'll just move over to the next tree. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if your tree does have a dray in it, then you might want to wait until uh, like spring or summer, um, just when they're going to have access to a lot of materials. You wouldn't want to do it in the winter. Um, and then the other thing is that if you have a dead tree on your property, um, you wouldn't want to remove that in the fall or the winter because a lot of animals are probably going to depend on that in the winter to try and stay warm and stay safe. Um, I am not a wildlife expert either. I am a zoology, I am a zoology major, but I'm not a, you know, a wildlife rehabilitator or anything. Um, there's a lot of great resources from MSU Extension and actually uh, Jim Harding, who is uh, one of our, one of our uh, old curators at the museum, um, is what we call the Critter Guy. And he's got lots of great information on his website. You can look up Jim Harding or James Harding. And he's got all sorts of uh, factoids and helpful hints about wild, Michigan wildlife. So there's a couple of different places you could maybe check out. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and then the final animals that we're gonna talk about here that you might be seeing in your backyard pretty soon. I'm gonna have to move my camera so we can get down to take a look at them. And those are going to be a couple of our friends here. And just a warning in case you are scared of them, we are gonna be looking at some snakes. Um, these snakes are really, really cool. They're some of my favorite animals. Um, we have a garter snake here, an Eastern garter snake, and we have a milk snake right behind me, an Eastern milk snake. Um, there are 17 different species of snakes in Michigan. Um, only one of them is venomous. That's the Mossasaga rattlesnake. And even that, uh, you know, is not, particularly dangerous. You obviously shouldn't pick one up, but just so long as you're keeping an eye out, you know, it's 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 more scared of you than you are of it. Um, so no snakes in Michigan are, are really dangerous, other than, you know, Massasauga rattlesnake is venomous, but, um, but snakes in Michigan are really, really cool. So they're another animal that you might be thinking, obviously snakes can't go on a huge migration the way the birds do. Um, so you might be wondering what happens to snakes in the winter and how do they start up here in the spring? Um, and snakes actually create nests as well, similar to squirrels. Um, very different from squirrels in the way that their nests look, but similar in that they do have nests. Um, so most snakes in Michigan will actually hibernate. Um, they use something called hibernacula, um, and those are going to be uh, either native caves, uh, natural caves that form you know, underneath the ground in Michigan. They might be holes made by other animals. Um, but the really cool thing about snakes is that usually they're uh, pretty isolated. They don't like to hang out with a lot of other snakes until it comes to fall and winter. And so in these hibernacula, um, if there's a good natural cave, there's a good hole, um, all of these snakes will actually come together to hibernate together in this hole. So sometimes you might see videos online of people discovering one of these hibernacula or uh, you know, watching all the snakes emerge in the spring. And you can see, you know, sometimes 10, 20, uh, in, you know, huge cases are going to be like hundreds of snakes in these, in these natural sort of caves. Um, that, uh, that the snakes hibernate in to try and keep themselves warm during the winter. They form a big cuddle pile, which is pretty fun. Um, we won't be seeing any snakes in our gardens probably for a couple of months. Um, they're starting to emerge right about now in April and May, starting in the spring, um, but they don't usually start appearing in people's gardens and yards until the summer. Um, they tend to hang out pretty close to that hibernacula for a little bit, just in case they need to, you know, duck back in there and try and, try and stay warm. Um, so we won't be seeing them in Michigan for just a little bit.
but Michigan snakes are pretty cool, pretty fun. So those are some of the animals you might be seeing in Michigan pretty soon. Of course, there are lots more. We didn't cover insects. Um, we have, of course, you might have heard about the big cicada swarm coming pretty soon. As they start to emerge out of the ground this summer. Um, there's all sorts of other animals and plants as well. Um, but that's just a little bit of a touch of what we might be seeing coming in our backyards this spring. Um, with that, that's all the, the time that we've got pretty much today. We're about at the end of our time. Um, if anyone does have any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the next two minutes. But otherwise, I want to thank you guys so much for coming and learning about spring on the sphere. Um, we had a really good time today, at least I did, uh, looking at the sphere and then being able to explore the museum a little bit. Um, so I hope that you all have you know, a wonderful rest of your days. Unless you've got questions, then of course I'm happy to, to answer those. So we'll wait just a couple of minutes. but. If you don't have any questions, you're uh, you're free to, to head out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. All right, cool. So we will we will wrap up then. But thank you so much, everybody who ended up coming out. Uh, we really really appreciate it. All right, have a good rest of your days. <laughs>